All right, so let's open with prayer, and then we'll get into our end time study. Jesus, I pray, God, that you would uh, be with us today as we study your word, as we open up the scriptures to understand what is before us as the church, what is uh, our, our hope and our calling of the rapture, and then, Lord, for those that are left behind, what are they going to be experiencing and what are they going to expect? God, help us to take this information and use it to persuade people to be ready for your coming and to be uh, baptized in your name so that they can find heaven and find salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So let's go to uh, Titus 2, 11 through 13, and um, I am skipping to the, uh, 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 the end of our lesson where we left off last time. So Titus 2, 11 through 13, and uh, who would like to read, please? Cindy will read. read. Cindy will read this one. Go ahead. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's saying here that we should live uh, live denying worldly lust, denying ungodliness, that we need to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And that, that's important to understand that it's today, that we are able to do that by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're able to yeah. overcome. We're able to live we're able to live righteously, which means to do the right thing. We're able to soberly means to be a, a re, a re, or excuse me, what's the word? Um, live expectingly, live reasonably, using your brain, using your mind, not being swayed by doctrine to and fro. But we want to be sober, be righteous, and godly in this present world. But we don't just do that to be righteous. We don't just do that to be godly. We're looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of Jesus Christ when he comes back and he splits the clouds. And at that moment, we go from being mortal to immortality. We go from being a physical in a physical body to then uh, being in a glorified body. And at that moment, we'll leave this earth, we'll leave everything behind, and we will meet him in the clouds. And the Bible says that forever we shall be with him. And it's at that moment that we leave this earth and we head to what is known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will, for seven years, be with our, our husband-to-be, our bridegroom, and we will uh, have that great feast with him. We're going to drink that cup that he said that he would not drink until we all gathered together with him in heaven. And so at that point, the fourth cup of that, that uh, Passover meal that was never drank will be drank with him in heaven. And then down here on earth is what we're going to uh, take a look at. We're going to focus on what happens because while we're seven years in heaven, there's going to be seven years of God's wrath poured out here on the earth. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so I want to, uh, we're going to go and we're going to actually get into talking about the great tribulation. But if you would, at the bottom of the screen, I want you to take notice 
of a timeline that's there. And this is the 70 weeks of Daniel. We've got on the left side, you've got the Babylonian captivity, and then uh, out of the Babylonian captivity, Nehemiah rebuilt the temple that took 49 years or seven weeks. The, uh, the Bible uses the term week as a group of sevens, and in this case, it's seven years. So seven times seven is 49. That's how many uh, weeks it took to build the, uh, the temple and the, the walls of Jerusalem. And then from that point until Christ came in on, on the donkey at the triumphal entry was another 62 weeks or 434 years. And at that point, Jesus Christ was crucified. And, and uh, let, let's go look at this in Daniel 9. And we're going to go to verse 24 through 27. And uh, Janine, you had volunteered before. I'll let you read this. Praise the Lord. Oh, you're back, Janine. <laughs> okay, so Cindy, will you read? Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the to transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, let's stop there. So this is the reason for the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 70 years or the four, excuse me, 77s or 490 years of of a captivity of of a judgment against the Jewish people, and it was to finish the transgression. The Jewish uh, believer was to rest the year, the excuse me, rest the land every seventh year, and so for seventy sevens or four hundred and ninety years, the Jewish people neglected to rest the land, and so God brought the the Babylonian kingdom to come and take them into captivity for those seventy years, and and so. In other words, the Jews owed God 70 years of rest, and God forced it upon them and took them into captivity. And so the, that's the judgment. That's what God said is, is to be uh, um, uh, determined upon the people of God, the Jewish people. Understand this, that the 70 weeks are not for the church, they're for the Jew. And so this is a Jewish judgment. And so during those 70 weeks, we've got seven weeks of rebuilding the temple, 62 weeks till the time of, of Christ's crucifixion. Go ahead and keep reading, Cindy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. That's the 49 years. And three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in the troublous time. So the wall is rebuilt and now we have 62 weeks. Keep going. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That's talking about Jesus Christ dying on the cross at the end of the 62 weeks. Keep going. But not for himself. He didn't die for himself. He died for us. 
and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Okay, so that's jumping ahead to the point of the uh, the people of the prince. That's talking about the the people from which the Antichrist will come, that they uh, will destroy the, the city and destroy the temple. And that's going to happen in 70 AD, or did happen, excuse me, in 70 AD. Keep going. And he, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desert okay so now this last seven weeks is what is called daniel's 70th week and if you look at that timeline at the bottom you see the church age down here that's where we're at right now and when the church age comes to an end, that's when the last seven weeks or seven years of uh, Daniel's 70th week will be fulfilled. And that he's, it says that he shall, um, uh, let me find, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's talking about the Antichrist is going to sign a treaty of peace with the Jewish people. And it goes on and it says that the sacrifice and the oblation, that they're going to be able to sacrifice and offer animal sacrifice again on the Temple Mount. But in the midst of that week, after three and a half years, that that's going to stop. And the reason is, is because of the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist is going to go into the temple and sit himself down and declare himself to be the Messiah, God, and, and the Jews at that point, are, their eyes will be open, and they're going to recognize we've been duped. And at that point, they reject the Antichrist, and the Antichrist gets, gets furious and pours out his wrath upon the people. And then God turns around and adds to that by pouring out wrath upon wrath. And so... We're going to see in the Great Tribulation, we're going to see earthquakes, we're going to see wars, we're going to see famine, we're going to see death, and we're going to see boils upon the uh, the hands and the bodies of people. Dave, you had a your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, uh do you know exactly when the two witnesses will be showing up? That'll be in the midst of the seven years. And okay. We'll, we'll, okay, so remember this. I, I don't want to get caught up in a lot of the details of the book of Revelation, because on Wednesday right. night, we're going to start studying the book of Revelation. But I want to hit some highlights and some key points that we can point to and say, oh, okay, now I know what's going on. But that's a good question. And uh, that's one of the seven raptures in the church is the rapture of the two witnesses. They're going to be killed. They're going to lay in the streets for three days. God's going to raise them up mm -hmm. and then resurrect them and take them to heaven. And that's, uh, that's going to be a sign to the Jewish people of, of the power of God, and ultimately, at the end of the seven years, when Christ comes back, and I'm jumping ahead in our study tonight, at the Battle of Armageddon, they're actually going to recognize Christ for who he is. He is Messiah. But that, that's a good question, David. 
So anyway, we're uh, we're looking at the this great tribulation and throughout the book of revelations from about revelation 6 to about revelation 20 you're looking at that time period that we call the great tribulation in uh chapter 6 and uh 8 through 8 you're going to see the seven seals you're going to see the, the angels with the seven trumpets in about eight and nine. And then you're going to see the angels with the seven vials in, in Revelation 16. So uh, it'd be a, a good read, especially since on Wednesday we're going to start studying the book of Revelation and we're going to break it down. My, my hope is to be able to go through it book, or excuse me, verse by verse, but uh, we'll see with time, you know, we've only got an hour each night to, to really break down the scripture, but we'll see what the Lord leads and, and how he allows things to unfold. So finally, uh, let, let's go look at Revelation 6. Verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> and this is the fourth seal. In fact, the first seal is the, uh, the white horse. And then the second seal is the red horse. The third seal is the, the uh, black horse. The fourth seal is the pale horse. And then here in verse seven and eight we're looking at that four seal the pale horse so uh who would like to read i'll read it thank you go ahead and when he had opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Okay, so this is talking about in this first part of the opening of the the, uh, the seals, you lose a quarter of the earth. So we're running between seven and eight billion people right now on earth. And uh, with the rapture and, uh, you know, a, a, a portion of the earth gone, let's say there's seven billion left on earth. A quarter of that would be 1.75 billion people that will die in this horse seal. And that's from uh, from uh, war. It's from sword is war from hunger because there's going to be a famine, and uh, from the beasts of the earth even. And now that beast of the earth could be literal or it can be figurative. And so uh, we need to understand that the Book of Revelations can talk in word pictures as much as it can talk in, in literal truth. And so we need to be able to understand that. But, but what is literal is the fact that about one, one and three quarter billion people are going to end up dead in that, just in that four seal. Um, just real quick, go, okay. go ahead. Someone had a question. No, okay. Going back to uh, verse one, um, it's talking there about one open the seal, praise the Lord. And uh, it says, and I heard it as were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see, behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown and was given unto him when he went forth conquering and to conquer. 
This is the Antichrist coming onto the scene. So once the church is removed, once the, in fact, go to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 7. Who would like to read there? I'll read, Pastor. All right, Lynette, go ahead. For the mystery of inequity doth already work. Only he who only he who now let let it will let yeah, let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Very good. So he will let until he be taken out of the way. And and that word let or letteth in the old English means to hinder. So we're talking about he who will hinder will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And, and so uh, to understand that verse, you have to understand what the mystery of iniquity is. And the mystery of iniquity is the appearing of the Antichrist. And, and that, that Revelation uh, chapter 6, where we read in verse 1 about the white horse. Let's go back there. Well, before we go there, who, who is it that's holding back the Antichrist? Jesus. The, well, the, it's the Jesus church. in the church. Because look okay. what it says. He, he will hinder until... We are holding he, back Jesus. He will hinder until he be taken out of the way. So at the rapture of the church, when the church leaves the earth, then the Antichrist will be free to come on the scene. And so this is, uh, going back to Revelation 6 and 1, the white horse, verse 2, Behold, I, I, I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Notice he has a bow, but no arrows. Okay, and a crown was given unto him. Now, this is in contrast to uh, the picture of Christ coming back on a white horse that we'll read about in Revelation 19. We're going to read he had many crowns. So the mm -hmm. Antichrist has a crown. He has some power, but not all power. And, and so he, he was given authority to go forth and conquer because now at the point that the church is removed out of the earth, now he's given license and he's not being hindered. It, it's your prayers that are holding back the Antichrist today. And we need to pray that those prayers, we need to pray, God, hold back the Antichrist for a time. Let my family get saved. Let my loved ones get saved. Let my friends and my co-workers get saved before the Antichrist comes. Because once the Antichrist comes on the scene, it's too late. It, it's too late. You, 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 if you miss the rapture, you're going to go through the tribulation. And you've got, got one of two ways to, to go there. You're either going to take the mark of the beast so that you can eat, so that you can feed your family, because you're without the mark, you, you cannot buy food, you cannot buy clothing, you cannot pay your rent. At that point, you have to have a mark in your right hand or under your for the scalp in your forehead. And that's how you're going. It's not going to be a credit card in your wallet. Now you're going to scan your the back of your hand. Now you're going to scan your forehead. And that's how you're going to pay for your groceries. And when you got little kids, if you're not, if you miss the rapture, you're going to face the, the, the Antichrist and the, the, the beast system, which we're going to look at tonight. So we want to be ready 
for his coming. We want to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do not want to miss the rapture. Are you with me? Okay. Yes, Pastor. Praise the Lord. So at the point the Antichrist comes on the scene, that's the white horse with the rider that had a bow but no arrows, had a crown, had some authority, and he was given permission to go forth and conquer the earth. And a 1.75 billion, with a B, people die in that seal, that fourth seal, when it's open. His system is a political system, and it's a military system. It's an economic system, and it's a political system all wrapped into one. It's going to be a one world government and a one world religion. It's going to be a one world currency, and it, it's all going to be tied together. And that's how that they're going to track you with that chip that's in your hand. If you, if you take the mark of the beast, the Bible says you will be damned. Let's, in fact, let's go look at this. Go to Revelation and for chapter 13. And let's go to Hallelujah. Uh, go down to verse. Uh, Praise God. 16, 17, 18. Cindy, will you read Revelation 13, 16 through 18? And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the name or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So six 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 is the number of the beast, and and really the beast is not just the antichrist. The beast is really the system, the whole system. It's a one world government that is controlled or headed by the Antichrist. But there's also going to be a religious aspect, the false prophet who's going to point people to the Antichrist to worship him as God. He, he's, his whole scheme is to get the world to bow down and worship him as God. And that's when, at three and a half years, he doesn't just try and get the world to bow down to him, but that he goes and approaches the Jewish temple, and that's when the Jews see and say, this is not the Antichrist. We reject him. And at that point, all hell begins to break loose in the, in the world. So at the first, the, the Antichrist, uh, we read in Daniel 9, that he writes and signs a covenant of peace with many. That's talking about the Jewish people being able to institute their animal sacrifice again, uh, which if, if you listen to Bishop McDonald's teaching, uh, he talks about the red heifer that is right now is in Israel. They shipped over five of them. My understanding is that two of them have disqualified. Uh, they found mm -hmm. white hairs or black hairs or whatever. They weren't pure. They weren't unblemished. But Bishop said one of them had been disqualified. So at this point, they either have three red heifers or four red heifers. And the, and the key, the, the point to make there is that it takes the red heifer to sanctify the temple that they're going to build on the temple mount. So that, that's promised in the word of God, that that's prophecy that the temple will be rebuilt 
and they are going to be able to institute their Jewish tradition of offering animals for the sins of the people. And I know that, you know, animal lovers around the world are going to flip. They're going to go haywire and start screaming bloody murder. But uh, that that's the way God instituted it in the Old Testament. And the, the, the Jews' issue is they rejected Christ. So they're living under the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. uh, go to James 2 and 10. Somebody read that to me, please. Erica, will you read James 2 and 10? Um, first of all, I mean, fucking hit James 2 and 5. 2 and 10. Verse 10. You there? Okay, did we lose Erica? Okay, uh, Janine, will you okay. read? There so whoever said, uh, take my... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear you now. Okay, so take my brother and the prophets who have spoken the name of the Lord, no. for example... As... James, no? James 2 and verse and 10. Was... It's New Testament. It's almost at the end of the Bible. James, J-A-M, chapter I got two. it, Pastor. I can read it. Go ahead, Christopher. Thank you. <laughs> for, who, for, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, so if you as a Jew are trying to keep the whole law, but you offend in one point, you're guilty of the entire law. Mm. See, that's the problem with trying to live according to the law. We've got, there There are, are, quote, Christian churches that say you have to worship on, on a Saturday. That Sunday worship is actually, they call it the mark of the beast. And, and that, that Saturday worship is a have to. If you don't worship on Saturday, then you're, you're damned. But, but the Bible says that if you try to keep the, the law by obeying, you know, the, the Old Testament commandments, but you offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. And uh, going to Colossians 2, Colossians 2 and verse 15, uh, excuse me, 16 uh, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Who would like to read that? I'm, I'll read that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Erica. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Okay, stop there. Which, Stop there a second. So don't let any man judge you according to Sabbath days. That's talking about Saturday worship. Okay, verse 17, go ahead. Which are shadow things to come, but the body is of Christ. So really the Sabbath day on Saturday is a picture, a shadow of what is coming. See, the, the Sabbath is not a day. The Sabbath is the Holy Ghost. And, and we yeah. can get into that and, and go down a rabbit trail, but, but we have to understand that the Jews are trying to live by the law. And, and it, because of the fact that the Antichrist signed off a treaty and allowed them to, uh, to start performing Old Testament sacrifices, that they're, they're actually going to be putting that into practice. But the, the issue is that at the three and a half year mark, halfway through that seven year tribulation, the, the Antichrist is going to demand worship from them, and they're going to reject him. And at that point, all hell's going to break loose. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I want to keep moving here. Let's talk about at the end of time. So, so what's going to happen is we're going to see the world turn against the Jews. When they reject the Antichrist, the Antichrist system, the world system, remember now it's a one world government, it's a one world currency, it's a one world religion, it's one world pol political machine, it's a one world everything. The, the whole government is one system, and it's the Antichrist who is the head of that system. So when the Antichrist goes in and sits down, let, in fact, let's, let's uh, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4. Cindy. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Stop right there. So the man of sin is going to be revealed when he steps into the the Jewish temple and sits himself down and demands them to recognize him as the Messiah. He is that son of perdition, verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So he is declaring, I am Messiah. I am God manifest in the flesh. And he's demanding worship. And at that point, then the Jews are going to reject him, saying, you are not Messiah. And they're going to, it, it, it's the desolation or the, uh, um, the, the abomination of desolation. It's going to be an abomination and a desolation and a, 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 a de-sanctifying uh, of the temple. They're going to ru bums rush him out of the temple, and they're going to, to declare that temple to be desecrated. It needs to be sanctified again at that point. But this is where... All, at that point, the, the Antichrist begins to organize and come against the Jewish people. And at this point, we've got armies of the world that are coming against uh, Jerusalem, coming against the Jews, coming against the Jewish people and the nation of, of Israel. And at this point, we're going to see that there are uh, there is a uh, just a preparing for war, a preparing for an annihilation of the Jews, which, you know, throughout time, we're, we're watching it today. We're, we're watching it on our university campuses, the, the mm -hmm. call for the annihilation and the extinction of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. It's an antichrist spirit. And so let, let's go to Revelation and let's look at the Battle of Armageddon because it all culminates in the Valley of Megiddo. And the Valley of Megiddo is a crossroads for the world. There have been many military campaigns fought in this valley. Almost every uh, major uh, military campaign by by those that set out to conquer the world, it, they went through the Valley of Megiddo. And so we're going to see here in Revelation 16, verse 14 through 16, we're going to see the, the, uh, um, the, the Battle of, Mag of uh, Armageddon and, and what's going to happen. So who would like to read uh, 1614 of Revelation? I'll read it. 
Thank brother. you, Janine. And you're going to read through verse 16. Okay. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Amen. So that's where the armies of the world come and they are facing off with the Jewish people. And, and so this battle begins to rage. You've got the Antichrist and his armies, and you got Israel and their armies. And it's not looking good for the Israelis. Let's go to uh, Revelation 19 and, uh, and verse 11. Cindy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Keep going. His eyes were as, fl as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a, a name that no man knew but he himself. So notice he has many crowns, mm -hmm. okay? not just a crown, but many crowns. So he has conquered many a foe. And, and so he, he comes with eyes of fire. He's got a, a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And verse 13, keep reading. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay, now that's us. So we have been in heaven for seven years at the marriage supper of the Lamb, worshiping God, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we have been worshiping him, partying with him, eating and feasting with him, drinking that fourth cup that had not yet been drank at the, the last supper, that Jesus said, I, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine till I am with you in heaven. That fourth cup will be drank and we will be the bride of Christ. He will be our husband and we will be married to him, and we are going to come back with him to earth to, to fight for Israel. We are going to come back and fight against the, the Antichrist and his ar armies. And verse 15 and 16, Cindy. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on, it, on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, so he's coming and it says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And I believe just like in the beginning, God said, let there be light, that he is going to speak to the armies of the Antichrist and say, let there be not. And out of his mouth will come that sword, that two-edged sword, the word of God that is going to vanquish and annihilate the enemies of of the Israeli people. And it says in verse 15 that he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. And he is that he will treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. In the first three and a half years, you're going to see the wrath of man, the Antichrist, be poured out. But in the last three and a half years, you're going to see the wrath of God poured out. If, if we go and look, we lose another 1.75 billion people in this, this escapade of man's wrath and man's uh, um, uh, disobedience to God. 
And so we're down to three and a half billion people left on earth. And, and he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to, to rule them as God Almighty here on earth. Let's go to uh, verse 20. Uh, in fact, go to 19 and 20, Cindy. And I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and, the arm, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So now the judgment is going to be poured out. The Antichrist is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Those that follow after him into the lake of fire. And this brings us then to what is called the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment is a judgment of the lost, those that are, are in sin. Now, this, as, a, as a, uh, a pivot here, I want to talk about the fact that once we get to heaven, once we are raptured and we're in heaven, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ, otherwise called the Bema seat, B-E-A-M-A, -A, I believe it is, Bema seat, is for rewards for those who are righteous. That, that's the church. And that's where we're going to get our crowns. That's where we're going to get our rewards. That's where God's going to give us authority over peoples and, and lands and and. I, maybe planets. I don't know what his plan is, but but we will be given a position in the kingdom as king and priest, and we will rule with him forever. But now here at the end of time, after the Antichrist is thrown into the lake of fire, after the Antichrist has been uh, his followers have followed after him and been tossed into the lake of fire. Then we're going to see a judgment on those who are lost. So let's go and look at Revelation 20, verse 11, and we're going to read down through verse 15. So who would like to read Revelation 20, starting in verse 11? And I saw <laughs> a great white throne and him that sat on it from who faced the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead was judged out of those things which was written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which is were in it, and the death and hell delivered upon the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to the works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whoever's was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, very good. Okay, so this is the judgment of those who died lost. And those who are dead, they're going to be resurrected. They're going to stand before this great white throne, and they're going to be judged according to their works. Everything you ever did in life, will be paraded in front of you, and you will be judged for it. Now, thank God, when we repent, we judge ourselves. And, and we're not going to, to have our mistakes paraded in front of the world. And, and I say, thank you, Jesus, because yeah. I've got many a sin that have been covered by the blood. But our sins are in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. And they will never see God loves us so much. He would not ever embarrass us like that. 
but those who reject him are going to end up standing before him. Now notice it says that there were books, plural, opened. Those are the 66 books of the Bible that you're going to have your life judged by. And then another book, which is the book of life, is open. And if your name's not written in the book of life, then you will be cast into the lake of fire. So how do the, the question is, how do I get my name in the book of life? And the way you do that is by obeying the gospel. Repent be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to make mention that the name is where the power of attorney is. That's, that's where the authority is. It, it, Philippians tells us that God has given him a name higher than any other name, that at the name mm -hmm. of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord and God. Amen. Amen. So it's Amen. that's how we wow. need to be baptized in the wow. name. The name matters, okay? Saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that, that doesn't do it. That, that'd be like taking your checkbook and signing Father and handing out a check. It won't cash. So we need to obey the gospel. It's our obedience that is the key to get us into heaven and so we obey that gospel, and our name is written in the book of life. And then I have an assurance that when I stand before God, I'm going to have rewards rather than a judgment. But those who are not in the book of life, that it says in verse 15 that they are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, I, I want to pivot real quick. I've got about five, 10 minutes here. I want to talk about the millennial kingdom and, um, and what it, there's a, from this point here, there's a thousand year period where the, the, the uh, devil and the serpent, the dragon who's in the bottomless pit is uh, held for a thousand years, and there's peace on earth here, here on earth, and Jesus will reign for a thousand years. Now, this Bible study, I have really enjoyed it, but there was no mention of the millennial reign. It goes from here to eternity. So I'm, I'm pulling out my search for truth, and I want to just hit a couple of scriptures. Let's go to Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. So same chapter, go up to verses 1 through 3. And uh, Cindy, will you read about the devil being bound a thousand years? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to, of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking he said, shut up. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. He should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Okay, I want to make notice here that in verse one it says an angel. It does not say an archangel. It doesn't mm -hmm. say Michael. It doesn't say Gabriel. It doesn't oh. name the angel, but it's just a common angel. And, and he, he took him, took this, the devil, and, and he opened, he had a key to open the bottomless pit, which tells me that he had a key in one hand, and he unlocked the door, and he had the devil in one hand, the other hand, and threw him into the bottomless pit. It, it wasn't like he had to wrestle him. It wasn't like he had to force him in there, but he just grabbed him up and threw him in one-handed. And so I'm believing that's, that's a picture for us. 
that we, if we walk in the authority of God, we can take authority over the devil in our life. He tries to come, he tries to attack us, he tries to persuade us with lies. We talked about it last night in Connect Group. He's a liar and the father of all lies, but we have authority with one hand we can command him to go, and he's got to go. In the name of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Okay. Yes, so going back to uh, my scriptures here, I want to go to, um, let's go to Zechariah 8 and 12. And we're going to talk about the fact that Eden is, is recreated during that thousand years. Zechariah 8 and verse 12. Who would like to read? I'll read it. Thank you. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heaven shall give their dew. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. All these things, all this fruitfulness is going to be ours during a thousand year reign. We're not going to have to toil by the sweat of our brow to, to grow food. We're not going to have to, you know, uh, fertilize and, and, and coerce the earth to give forth and bud, but it's just going to happen for us. Amen. One, one more scripture here. I want to talk in um, Isaiah 11, verse 6 through 8. Isaiah 11, verse 6 through 8. Chris, do you want to read? Or Cindy, do you want to read? Six through eight. Yes. Isaiah what? Isaiah 11, six through eight. I'll read. Okay, Lynette, go ahead. You're back. <laughs> I okay. thought you dropped off there a moment, so... No, I've been back. I've just, uh, okay, 11, 6 Denver. through 8. 6 through 8, yes. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, the, the fall, the fall bat, team to The battling, battling. Oh, bat, battling together, and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the suck suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice cockatrice den okay the asp and the cockatrice are both poisonous snakes but it's talking right. about that the little babies are just going to play around with them because the animal nature has changed You've got the wolf lying down with the lamb, and, and the wolf does not, you know, it's not the three little pigs and the big bad wolf type of a mentality, <laughs> but it, it there's a change. The leopard lies down with the goat, the little baby goat. So there's a change in this millennial kingdom from, from adversarial, from uh, predatory to being a docile, being a... A uh, gentle being, uh, you know, the, it, it said that the uh, um, lion's going to eat straw. You know, how many times do you you see a lion, uh, you know, attacking the the bush and and eating a bush? No, you always see him attacking some wildebeest or something like that on YouTube. You know, it, it's it's there's a change in this thousand years. And so for a thousand years, the world is going to have peace. 
we're going to have a, a new headquarters. The new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven, and we will uh, call that our, our city, our, our holy city. And we're going to serve God out of the new Jerusalem. We're going to uh, uh, go to the city to get our marching orders, and then we'll go out into the the kingdom and we'll rule the people uh, with that rod of iron that God has said He's going to keep them. And and now here here's the thing: during that thousand years. During the, the time of the thousand-year reign of Christ, there will be babies that are born. There will be a, a life that comes into to existence during that time that has never been tested by the devil. So at the end of that thousand years, God's going to release the, the devil out of the bottomless pit, and he's going to wreak havoc one more time for a little season upon the earth. He's going to tempt those that have uh, never been tempted, and those that are pulled away, those that fall away, are going to end up with a, a quick judgment, and it's going to be during the, the war of Gog and Magog that you read about in uh, Ezekiel 37, 38, somewhere in there, there's going to be a, a war. They're, they're going to come out of the north, out of Russia. You're, they're going to come out of the east, out of China. And uh, the Euphrates will dry up. They're going to march across. And then again, one more time, God's going to squelch that uh that rebellion, and from there we enter into a time that we call eternity. And so let's go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're almost done here, and verse 10. Cindy, will you read... Uh, 2 Peter 3 and 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay, so we're going to see this earth is judged at the very end. And then we're going to pass into eternity. All things are going to be melted with a fervent heat, it says. And, uh, and the earth also, and all the works that are in the earth are going to be burnt up. God, remember God said, I will no more flood the earth. And he gave us a rainbow as a promise. But the, the scripture tells us the next time he judges the earth, it'll be with fire. And so that's what we're looking at. The, the earth will be a flame. The earth will end up being uh, 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 dissolved, if you will. Let's go to verse 13 here. And, um, and uh, Cindy, read verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise... Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Okay, so this is talking about the new Jerusalem. Let's let's go to uh, Revelation 21 and starting in verse 1. And uh, who would like to read Revelation 21 and 1? I would. Okay, go 21. ahead. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Keep reading. And, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Ooh, and I Check this out. Okay, so the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, and it says it's adorned as a bride. 
That's the church coming down. We are that church. We are the tabernacle of God. We are that new city that's going to come. And out of us is going to be the, the love of God, the light of God is going to shine from him through us to this world. Amen. That, that's Amen. awesome. That is a yeah. that is quite a revelation. To, uh, let, let's go to uh, Revelation 20. Uh, uh, well, here, here's the deal. I'm going to leave you to read uh, all the rest of Revelation 21 and 22, but I want to go to Revelation 22 and 1 right now. Revelation 22 and verse 1. And Cindy, will you start in verse 1? And he showed me a pure river of water of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the and the Lamb. Keep going. In the midst of the street of it, and on the other side of the river, where there the where there the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits, and yield her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Okay. Where was the last time we read about the tree of life? Genesis in the Garden. Eden. It was in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? It was when Adam and Eve sinned and God ushered them out of the garden and posted an angel with a sword that turned every direction guarding the tree of life. And now at the end of the Bible, we again see a tree of life, but on it now are fruit, a 12 manner of fruit that, that give its fruit in its season for the healing of the nations. And, and I want to say this, that Jesus is that fruit of life. He is that tree of life. He is the one that is for our healing. And when we partake and we we eat of him, and I don't mean that in a literal sense. I mean in a figurative sense that we partake of him and his word, his bread of life, that we can be healed, and then we can turn around and heal others as well. Are you with me? Let, let's go, yes. go down to the last two verses. Janine, will you read verse 20 and 21? Yes. Uh, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. again, I want you to go back and read Revelation 21 and 22 and realize that this is a picture of heaven. This is a picture of the eternity that we're going to spend with Christ. Amen. And so with that, we need to be mindful that we don't want to miss it and end up going through the tribulation. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he said, if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back again for you. I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, you shall be also. We don't want to miss the rapture and that train that takes yeah. us to heaven. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the Exploring God's Word Bible study, and we are going to uh, uh, next week get into talking about the topic of unforgiveness and talking about shame, and um, I believe that through that teaching that we are going to get a uh, deliverance and a freedom that that you know we feel like we're we're trapped like there's a ceiling right here that's not letting me bust through and I want to go higher in God that the thing that's keeping me down is a spirit of unforgiveness and a spirit of shame ultimately it's 
unforgiveness toward ourself that is the problem. So we're going to bust down that stronghold. We're going to pull down that stronghold. We're going to uh, uh, speak life, and we're going to speak healing into each of our minds and our spirits so that we can expand and enlarge our, our tents and strengthen or lengthen our stakes, as Isaiah talks about. And so in Jesus' name, uh, let's pray, and uh, we will end this for tonight. And I hope you enjoyed the lessons and uh, got something out of it, and we will hit it again running next week. So any questions, any comments, any thoughts from anyone? Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We give you praise tonight, God. Thank you, Lord, for mapping out the, the pathway to eternity for us, God. You've given us a clear direction, a clear road upon which we can walk. Help us to, to uh, obey that gospel, that we can be counted in covenant with you, God, that we can be your son, your daughter, God, that you would call us up hither when that trumpet sounds, and that we would see you and meet you in heaven heaven to be with you for all eternity, God. In the name of Jesus, save our families, save our friends, save our co-workers, save our neighbors, save our, our, our Lord, everyone that we come in contact with. I pray that there would be words that you put into our mouths that is a word timely fit and fitly framed for that person that we're speaking to. Use us for your glory and your kingdom. Save souls in this day, this age, this, this uh, late hour of 2024. We are just seconds away from the coming of the Lord. And I believe, God, that you are, are coming back for your people soon and very soon. In Jesus' name. Someone say amen. Name. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. I believe in God has is uh, just not just giving us something to uh, to hear and something to think about, but he's giving us tools to use in his kingdom. And so praise God. I love you praise all. God. See you. Love you too, and uh, we'll do it again next time. Okay. Praise yes, God. Thank God. You. God bless. Good night.